this in the shirt. Thank you. Um, so we're going to be talking about the conjuration of the seven, which is the next one. Last week we talked about the conjuration of the four. Everybody had a chance to look. You don't have a copy of that, do you? I've been keeping up with videos. Okay, good. Well, i got a copy. If you no, I'll take that. Yeah, well, no, that's cool. The conjuration of the seven is kind of the continuation. It's the one that you would do after that. And the conjuration of the seven, the seven we're talking about are basically the seven planetary bodies. And if you can remember from the very first information overload cabal lecture we did, there was the seven doubles. Remember the letters that were seven? Not, you know, not that you have to remember exactly what letters they were, but there were seven doubles. There's three mothers, seven doubles, twelve elementals. And the seven doubles represented this idea of polarity. So that, like say the thing is temperature, you have hot, you have cold. There's varying degrees of the same thing, right? This is what we're going to be talking about in this conjuration too. We're going to be using basically the positive polarity to conjure the negative polarity, and then we're going to look at what that means internally. A lot of the stuff that was left is uh, from Samael's work about him going to the astral plane and conjuring these things and seeing them. And we're going to keep in mind that this is the astral interpretation of these. But that the more important for us, the interpretation that we should be more concerned with is our own internal psychological interpretation of what these mean. So uh, would you like, maybe I should hand out a copy first so we can follow along if you want to. One, one, two, three. And there are seven of us here. Yeah. Pardon? Give me more lunch, Sure. Yeah. Read. Yeah. We're going to read. Five. Six. Seven. Six. Seven. I have the book, too, if you guys want to read the book. Yes. To go with the movie. Yeah, I have the book, too. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'll bring it because I won't have any time to read it. I'm trying, trying to read the Alchemist and I have a million things to do over the Christmas holidays. But okay, if so you want to read the book, you may. Okay. So this is the Conjuration of the Seven here. And we're going to go line for line. We'll reveal pretty much everything that Samuel left for us, which we'll see isn't a, a lot, but it's something. So we'll jump right into it. The first line In the name of Mikael, may Jehovah command thee and drive thee hence. Kavayot. Right. A lot of this is, a lot of these names are Hebraic, but we'll, we can transliterate them and pronounce them as in, in English. So what we see here is, Mikael is considered the chief angel above all others, and is said to command the army of angels loyal to God. His name from Hebrew translates to, who is like God, or the image of God, or the likeness of God, which implies that he is the closest angel being to God in the divine hierarchy. Mikael is the planetary angel of the sun, which is a symbol of spiritual strength and of the creative forces of God. Mikael also represents an independent part of our own being. Internally, Mikael is the positive force, or fire, that works with the negative force, or water, which is uh, seen as Gabriel, to complete the great work, the alchemical work. So Mikael is that. And, and there's, um, there's ancient Kabbalistic texts where they talk about the idea that, and I'll talk about this in my lecture next week, because as I told some of you, this is Ed's lecture, he just couldn't be here tonight, so I'm presenting his lecture for him. But uh, there's an ancient Kabbalistic text, they talk about that angels are principles, or spiritual principles, and that they reside within us, and that to the outer, the outer shell, or exoterically, people would see them as external beings, sort of like what we talked about earlier, but that really they're in, internal parts of ourselves, or the, like, Mikael is the likeness of God, and El, even the word El is God in Hebrew. So we have Mik Mika from the Hebrew, Mikino, who is like God. And all these, all the angels, and even some of the ones that were conjuring, like the, the demons, have El at the end of it. And anytime you see El, you know it's something of God. Samael, Raphael, Gabriel, Orifiel, they're all a principle coming from the prime source. We just have to start thinking more <coughs> abstractly about them not as concrete. So, the name Jehovah or Jehovah is an anglicized pronunciation of the Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton is a Latin or Greek word 
which means the four letter word, and the four letter word is referring to is yod heh vau heh which is the holiest name in the Hebrew scriptures, combined with the vowel points of the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord. So in the Old Testament, the name of Jehovah is applied to the host of the Cosmo creators or divine androgenies, right, the Elohim, who created this universe, rather than the original name, yod Hava. The original name being this yod heh vau heh In English, we say Jehovah, yes. Are you referring to Elohim in the plural because of the... The Genesis texts? Mm -hmm. okay. and, and that the em is a <coughs> plural suffix in, in the Hebrew language. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So but what, what, what Samael is saying here is that we, what we call Jehovah is referring to yod heh val -Hey to the Hebrews. It, the, the name Jehovah doesn't exist in Hebrew, right? But every time that comes up in the English Bible, Jehovah, it's translating yod heh val -Hey as Jehovah. Um, the supreme leader of the positive ray of the moon is Jehovah. So this is a little, seems a little, but if, that's less internal, but if we talk about it internally. Jehovah is Kabbalistically read Yod Chava. It can be Kabbalistically read as Yod Chava. This means that Yod, the male willpower, the brain, is through chastity dominating Chava, the female power of the Holy Spirit, the sexual organs. Thus the brain is dominating the sex. We're not talking about male and female as gender specific, but as the principles within each one of us, right? So this, the whole idea of this Jehovah or yod Hava is the idea that the brain is overpowering the sex. We're not a slave to our sexual desires, and we have it, you know, in control kind of thing. We're, we're the master of that, and it's not the master of us. But as we'll see, uh, Hava Yoth directs the negative ray of the moon, so this is the opposite polarity of the same thing. This demon cultivates the mysteries of black sexual magic. This is from the perfect matrimony. In relation with our personal psychology, Havayoth is Kabbalistically read Havayod, right? Which is exact opposite of Yod Hava. This means that Hava, the female power of the Holy Spirit, the sexual organs, is through fornication rebelling against the Yod, the male, or the brain. Thus, sex is dominating the brain. So it's the exact opposite pole. Or one is chastity, the other is fornication. And that's why in, uh, in the conjuration we're using one to conjure the other. We're using yod -Hava to conjure this name. As seen as negative. The name of God in Hebrew is yod -Hey val -Hey, as we have said. Written in English sometimes as I-H-V-H. -H, and is sometimes read as yod -Hava. This word read backwards, H-V-H-I, is Habayod or Habayov. The reason why there's this different spelling is because, like we said before, and all the problems we always have with Hebrew and English is that it's transliterated. So we don't have exact letters for it. Because that would be like, Chava Yod. We don't have a ch, right? And the, it can be a T, can be pronounced as a T or a TH, depending on the translation of Hebrew. It's just how that language is. So this reverse reading has the opposite meaning of the word Yod Hava, which is Jehovah, and embodies the opposite principles. Is it sort of making sense? Yeah. Feel free to ask lots of questions. Too. It was a little bit of a shorter lecture. And like I said, it was Ed's lecture, and I just got it last minute today because he had to go to his daughter's Christmas recitals. But what exactly does fornication mean? It doesn't mean all sex, does it? No, it means the spilling. It means sex. It means spilling the spilling the cup, basically. Oh, that's fornication. That's fornication. That, that's a, that's the definition we apply to in in, in gnosis and the Gnostic tradition. That's the idea of fornication. So it doesn't, it doesn't really mean... That would apply on both gender lines, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, on both which, sorry? Gender lines? Yeah, ju both gender lines. Yeah, exactly. It's basically the orgasm. Um, yeah. Um, so, it does Nowadays, it has more of a connotation of being promiscuity. That's what I thought. I was yeah. going to look that up, like yeah. in a dictionary. You know, and um, same with when we talk about chastity, we're not talking about not having intercourse, mm -hmm. we're talking about having intercourse while retaining the fluids. That's the original mm -hmm. idea of chastity mm -hmm. and gnosis. So we have different definitions for it than what have been handed down to this generation now. They've been sort of skewed by time. Mm -hmm. So this comes from Master Samael's book, and we'll remember that he's we're talking about in the astral plane now, so it gets more like, you have to remember sort of the astral plane, the plane of magic, the dream interpretation plane. So Master Samael, uh, an accompanying group, a group of other people who were in his group, invoked the demon Havayot in the higher worlds. They found themselves in front of a statue at a crossroad. 
The statue was very beautiful, like Apollo of the Greeks, but wore a blood-red tunic. Master Samael then said, In the name of the Tetragrammaton, I conjure you, Havayot. The malignant statue attacks them with hypnotic powers and with words that were disgusting. So astrally, this is the way it's being interpreted. It's being interpreted. Like, you can see how we can be hypnotically influenced by our negative sexual desires controlling our higher cognitive abilities. And, uh, and through that, you can start to, you know, the, the disgusting words and all that kind of stuff that comes along with being controlled by your sexual passions as opposed to having them under control. So it's good to interpret it that way also. They used all their spiritual strength to fight the demon, and he retreated into a bar in the astral plane. This is from one of Samael's books. Um, there's more. On another night, Master Samael and his committee invoked Havayoth a second time. They submerged themselves into the atomic regions and saw Havayoth approaching them. They conjured him, saying, In the name of Jupiter, Father of the Gods, I conjure you, Havayoth, te vigos coslin. This is, that, this is that one we were talking about before, the conjuration you can do in the astral plane. So if there's a negative entity, which is basically a reflection of your own psychology in front of you, but if you want to get that under control, you can say, in the name of Jupiter, father of the gods, I conjure you. And then with your hand on your belly button, te vigos coslim, te vigos coslim, te vigos coslim. And in the astral plane, you can actually physically see that, I guess it would be astral, you see that, as a lightning bolt striking this being... And if it's a negative entity, it could, you know, flee before you or it could change. Or sometimes you could be doing this to a positive entity or an entity that is neither here nor there, but just some, like, there's Justin in my bedroom, actually zombie, and zombie, and I'm like, oh, we're going to take you, let's go slim. And just not going to affect him because he's not, doesn't know what he's doing. Maybe he does. <laughs> will it hurt him, though? I, no, no. It will conjure a negative entity. This is, the whole idea of what you're doing here is now you're having the cognitive power of recognizing and being conscious, and you're conscious that there's a negative entity in, the, in this plane of magic, and the way to deal with it in the plane of magic is through this magical, this magical kind of invocations and stuff, but really it's more a recognition of, of you know, higher consciousness. Now you're getting rid of the negative entities that do like attack you in the astral, but at the same time, like we said, you're not going to die in the astral, right? Because you're having dreams. But the idea is to remain conscious. We're already dead in the astral, basically, because we're zombies in the astral. The idea is to gain life in the astral by gaining consciousness. So it's always good to relate it back to, to the psychology, because you don't want to cultivate too much superstition or think that you don't have control of your own self, because the work is internal and it is up to you. It's not You're not really a victim of the moon's rays or the sun's rays, although they have an influence, it's our, idea, it's our job to conquer those rays and become, you know, conscious of them and, and to rise above them. So the demon was hurt as by a fatal ray. Havayoth then asked the men about their wives, so, you know, more about the uh, disgusting language and stuff like that, but, <laughs> you know, you know those demons are... So uh, Samael extended his right hand and they followed Havayoth back to his cavern. Havayoth informed them that he had a physical body that resides in Germany. And uh, the demon informed them that he had many disciples and he taught them the sinister system of Black Tantra. Havayoth is the opposite of Jehovah. Jehovah works for the chastity of the world. So... So uh, the idea here is that you could have a physical body. The idea is like all of our fathers who are in secret have physical bodies. We're just, we're just detached from it because we're those bodies. And we're detached from it until we build the higher bodies that they can incarnate to. They have no way of really coming through into the physical world. But apparently this negative entity, this negative, negative spiritual principle, has a physical body residing in Germany. And through that body teaching the system of black, tant black tantrum, which would be the opposite of what we teach here. So, for Jehovah, like we said, chastity, have a yoke, fornication. That's the idea. And then, internally, it's the idea of conquering the idea of chastity and fornication within yourselves. Because all the enemies take place internally first, right? Remember, see, that's like one of the biggest weapons of the ego, is projecting an external enemy when one doesn't really exist. All the enemies are internal. So... If you, if you see there's an external enemy, it's kind of a perception of an external enemy, and it's a distraction from fighting the real enemy, 
It was internal and psychological. The ego that bottles up the consciousness. We've got to try and keep that in mind. We're always <laughs> at war. And it's with ourselves. <laughs> so, in the name of Gabriel, may Adonai command thee and drive thee hence by El. This is the second line there. I'm not sure how we split up on there. That's the next section we're going to do. Um, so, Gabriel is one of the seven primary intelligences of our solar system, and his name translates as strong man of God, or the strength of God, or the severity of God, right? The name is actually, as we talked about before, Gabura El, like the Sifroth Gabura, exact same word, which the Sifroth means strength or severity, same idea here. Only now it's Gabura El, strength or severity of God. The intimate Gabriel governs our, our own psychological moon. The psychological moon also has two faces, the visible, which is the conscious, and the hidden, the subconscious. The secret defects are found in the hidden part of our own psychological moon. It is obvious that defects, psychic aggregates, and perversities that we do not even remotely suspect exist in the hidden part of our own psychological moon. This is from the Pissa Sophia unveiled by Samael on War. The idea is like the actual physical moon has a dark side that we never see, Internally, our, psycho our, our psychology is the exact same way. We talk about it now in modern terms as the conscious and the subconscious. But we have to start to become conscious of the subconscious. Because that's where all our, our grossest and, and largest defects reside. That's why you have to really work at the ego. Like we're saying, the work against the ego is the most important, the most important first step on the path. Absolutely it is. So the Hebrew word Adonai translates into English as my Lord or Lord. Um, the Jewish tradition, in the Jewish tradition, whenever they came across the holy name of God, you know, yod heh vav we talked about, in scripture they would never pronounce it out of uh, respect. Uh, they would never pronounce it out loud, but instead would pronounce the word Adonai in its place. So whenever yod heh vav came up, they'd say Adonai. Because they weren't allowed to say that name. That's why it's the ineffable name, and it was so holy. They did this to preserve the sacredness of the ineffable name. To uh, pronounce the name yod heh vav -Heh out loud would be equivalent to taking it in vain because of the holiness that it represents. And even, I'm not sure if you put this in the slides or not, but so what they would do in Jewish scripture is they would put the modern vowel points underneath the yod heh vav -Heh, the model, modern vowel points for Adonai, to remind that when they're reading, they should read Adonai, and not yod heh vav -Heh. And then when that was translated, uh, from German biblical scholars, with the vowel points for Adonai, you get the word Jehovah. That's where it comes from. Because you have the Yod and the vowels for Adonai. And if you read that phonetically, it says Yahovah, which isn't the way that Yod Hey Val Hey is pronounced in Jewish scripture, but that's how we get the name Jehovah in English. And that's why it's a J also, because you know, uh, in German, the Y's and the J's and the Jah, that's why it's all this kind of thing. That's why it's Jehovah sometimes Yahovah. Uh, eventually the word Adonai became elevated to such a level of holiness that it, also, it, it is also no longer pronounced. But instead the word Hashem is used, which literally means the name. So now when they see yod heh vav -Heh in a in a service, in the synagogue, they'll say Adonai. Outside of the synagogue, they won't even say Adonai because it's so holy now. They say Hashem. Hashem meaning the name. Ha is the Hashem is the name. We're going to be talking about this kind of thing particularly in the next lecture because we have different levels of holiness, basically. And this is how we get it because they're, they, they cover the, the actual name with another name then through that association, that name becomes holy and then that one and that one. So, and then in the higher realms, this, this is crystallized as, as degrees of holiness, basically, of the Lord's divine name or God's divine names. So... Bael is a demon who rules the eastern part of hell and said to be a duke of hell and Satan's main assistant. A lot of this information comes from the old demonology and angel angelology texts, the Hebraic ones and, and uh, a lot of um, medieval ones also. He is said to rule over 66 legions of infernal spirits and appears in diverse shapes, sometimes as a cat, a toad, or a man, and sometimes as all three at once. He is said to speak hoarsely and has the ability to make one who invokes him invisible. So, I mean, we can take that how we want if you want to be really literal about it. I don't know if there's people out there who's trying to invoke him and be invisible in the physical plane. 
to me, maybe that's the, the, the would be the lowest grasping of concepts. Yes. Is this the same uh, Baal as uh, Baal or Baal? Um, I believe it is. It's like the Baal worship. The idea in the old scripture is just a little confusing because Baal means master. And it's used in several different belief systems. Sure, sure it is. Same with like, and uh, like the name for God is El, or in say Arabic Allah. They're kind of from the similar roots, right? And then when we get to English is where we get transliterations and we get these different ideas that don't really get the idea across. So as we know from looking at the words, say yod heh vav heh, we have a masculine and a feminine principle combined into one. And then, so it has a bigger connotation than just the word Jehovah, which to most maybe Western Christians just means is like a synonym for God with no implication of gender or plurality either. Well, like in Hebrew, if you say like Baal Hasulam, is this like that's the guy's name, master of the ladder? It can be positive or negative, but they always called Baal worship. Uh, every other nation who wasn't the nation of Israel who worshipped something else, where they worship a different master, the master was Baal. So even Baal worship could be different entities that they were worshiping. So one night in the astral body, Master Samael and his committee invoked the demon Baal. Baal. Baal was a tenebrous king who lived in a cavern in the Gobi Desert. There he instructed his disciples. He taught the black magic of the sublunar spheres. So all these guys are working against us with this black magic stuff. Um, he was dressed in the robe of a black magician. We did not make much friendship with him. His character was unapproachable. This is from Samael and what he, what he saw in the astral when they invoked it. Because they went line by line in, in the astral plane and invoked these things. Yes? Why are they invoking these demons? Like, what is the purpose? Their they idea, to... what they were trying to do is to understand what this entity was. And his idea, because these conjurations come down from a long line. Um, I've seen them written in the early 1700s. And I think they were trying to understand line by line what it, what it meant and what these demons were. You had the idea of like knowing what you're fighting against. And once you could re recognize this external demon in the astral plane, you could begin to recognize it within yourself and start fighting it in yourself where the battle really takes place. Is the idea of what they were doing. So Adonai, the son of light and happiness, was the opposite. So again, we have the whole idea between these seven is the polarity, different degrees. Yes. The degrees of separation are the separation from um, the, the God or Adonai or Elohim or etc. Cetera, well, et cetera. Yeah, the idea here is that. Because you said the juxtaposition of the last character mm -hmm. was um, Jehovah or. Yeah, having a yoke was, and Jehovah. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Now Adonai and Baal are two opposite extremes of one principle. Okay. That's why I like with Jehovah it was chastity and fornication. That's. Basically, you call it sex, right? The one principle. So they are they are intimately related that way, just like the seven doubles were related to each other. And the way the word set up implies how it means. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, these are also open for some interpretation and independent research. Like I said, there wasn't a lot of information left on, on these particular subjects, but they're important. So uh, these two opposites of philosophy were intimately related to the moon's rays. And they relate each one of these to a planetary body also. So, like in the physical, it can be seen as the moon. That's why they always have these vice regions, like Samael is the region of Mars. And Mars has all these attributes of war. I think we'll get into all that stuff, actually. But uh, they're always related to physical body, like a planetary body, the seven major ones. And then uh, internally, psychologically, and astrally, that kind of thing. So in the name of Raphael, be gone before Elial, Sam Gabriel. That's the next chunk we're going to tackle here. Raphael is one of the seven primary intelligences of our solar system. And his name translates as God heals or the healing of God. Right, Raphael. <coughs> Raphael is a planetary angel of Mercury. He is related to the element of air and to the metal Mercury. Raphael is considered to be the angel of healing and is therefore petitioned by the faithful members of various religions to grant them remedies and cure them from any number of ailments. So the idea too, like if we step back macrocosmically and, and really check out what's going on here, is that Raphael is this healing principle 
from the one source of God. And it, we always depict it like this, or in the astral plane it can appear something like this. The idea is that how at the top of the Sephiroth tree we are all one. So all these separate entities are just specific jobs coming from what we call God or the Ainsoth, the ab absolute abstract. And that's why they also say one angel can have one job and two angels can't have the same job. So if one angel had one job, that'd be two principles. And if two, two principles had the same job, it'd be, it'd be one principle, it'd be the same thing, like love. Love doesn't have the job of love and truth. That's two different principles is the idea. If we start looking at it higher like that. But it does get a little more abstract when we start looking at it as principles. So when we look at it like this and in the astral, it's more concrete because it's easier for us to understand because it's closer to the realm of the physical than, say, the ain't soft or the absolute abstract is. So this is from the, uh, some apocryphal uh, Judaic works. Um, Raphael cured Tobias. This is from uh, an ancient text called the Book of Tobias. Uh, cured Tobias of blindness by using the gallbladder of a fish. Later he drove away a demon of lust by burning the heart and liver of the same fish. This is why he is usually depicted in art as carrying or standing on a fish. This is more a little bit like historical. Um, this is why Raphael, you always see an angel, sometimes he's standing on a fish, sometimes he's holding a fish. It's from these ancient traditional stories that say that using the body parts of this fish, he would heal people. Now, obviously it's more important for us the internal aspects of this, but this is just where this kind of artwork comes from. The idea that they were healing, the f healing people using the fish. <laughs> <laughs> it is difficult to find exact meanings for some of the names in the conjuration. This is most likely due to the fact that the conjuration of the seven is very old and has been translated, and in some cases transliterated, from a number of languages. Right? I think it was first written down maybe by Eliphas Levi, who translated it from Hebrew into French, and then from French they went to Spanish through some island from Spanish, English. So you can see there's a lot of translations, right? It's a lot of translation. So Elial is the positive and Sam Gabriel is the negative. They're the two opposites of the same the two different polarities of the same unity basically. The opposite beings are principles that belong to the mental world. Meaning that uh, well there are many danger dangers in the mental world. For the ego is very strong here. Like we, yes, I am. Oh, right, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lost anyway. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't it know. It's very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> like going home. <laughs> yeah. No, no, don't, don't go home. home. Don't go home. <laughs> I hate coming away. <laughs> this, is, this is basically to give you an idea of, of what, where all these words come from. The main idea for doing this is just trying to explain why we do this. And why we're doing this is so that we can kind of the idea of the conjurations is to cast out the negative polarities or entities within us internally. Because once you go on the astral plane, what's internal becomes external, and it feels like maybe there's demons around you and everything. Meanwhile, this is a projection of your own internal egos. From the astral plane, you think of an ego, that ego's there, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. So they're internal representations. So we want to present this, I guess there is a lot of information here, but we didn't want you to think that you're just doing this dogmatically or that we just say, say these words and everything will be good for no reason. We wanted to go a little bit behind why we say these words and the <coughs> idea behind doing the conjurations and the idea behind doing the invocations. They do have effects. The, the most important thing you can do is to do them and notice their, their effects. I mean, I was in phase C once and I remember I wasn't overly interested in conjurations and invocations because I came from Roman Catholicism, which I found really dogmatic. And I thought, I don't really want to trade one dogma for another one. And then I had experiences that were getting pretty negative in like, whether it be night terrors or nightmares and these bad dreams and all kinds of things. And one night I woke up out of fear and I did the conjurations and it was peaceful. I didn't have any more of these nightmares or bad dreams. And I found even like when you're doing certain practices, like say alchemical practices, these help too with when you're, you know, when you're sleeping and unconscious in the astral is when you have a chance to, to perhaps fall because you're not as conscious as you are in the physical. This is kind of cleansing the internal aspects of you so and protecting you against your own negative side. Yes? So would it help to do the conjuration of the four or the seven, whatever, be, uh, 
in your bedroom before you go to bed? Absolutely. I, I do it every night. You know? I remember the strongest one was, I was like, I'm not doing it. I think I was, a, I was, yeah, anyways. I was like, I wasn't going to do it. I think I had been drinking that night or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I was just going to bed. I'm tired. It's late. And uh, I went to sleep. And then as soon as I closed my eyes, I could, I could still vividly see it was, a, was this grass hill with a cellar door open. And I was being drawn into it. And every inch of my being did not want to go in there. You can, like, just like one of those dreams you have. I can't explain why. I don't know what's down there. I just felt the terror and not wanting to go down there. Internally, I think it was into my own subferior regions of my own subconscious. So I woke, woke myself up just out of fear, and I did them. And I thought, you know, there's something to, there is something to this. There is something to this. And when I first started to, rip, to try and think about this stuff a lot, I'd be like, well, maybe it's a placebo effect. And I said, well... A placebo effect is effect is an effect. People always overlook that. You give them sugar pills and tell them it heals them, and then they're healed. That's, that's that's an effect of the mind. I'm not saying they are like a placebo effect. I just when I, I it took me a long time to rationalize and understand these because I'm not at this super high mastery level. I had to really understand why am I doing these? Why am I spinning in a circle and doing the star and everything? And <laughs> I really want to see it work. Yes. So once you start doing these every mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to keep doing them, right? Well, I mean, right. it's your choice. It'll be it's hundred percent your have choice. A nightmare. <laughs> because like I'm not really having nightmares sure. that I know of right now, but I guess the more you progress, the more you remember your dreams. Absolutely, right? these things help with that. They help with remembering the dreams. They help with oh, having okay. positive uh, mm -hmm. experiences in the astral. That's the idea. Okay. So they help. I would recommend doing them every okay. night, but I'm not gonna say go home and do these every night or kick me out of here, you know, it's not really like that. Do you do one or the other or do you do them both? I, I do all three of them. So there's With, four, seven, and there's... And the Invocation of Solomon, which we'll be doing next week. Oh, you do all those. Uh, How long does that all take? Mm, well, I mean, I have them memorized by now, so it's... Wow, you've this whole paper? Yeah, but yeah, I've been doing it for a while, so I've got a lot of years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not like you have to memorize it overnight. So do you have these on, uh, online? Yeah. So and, and It'll be online. And is there, there's an audio? There's an audio with oh, each good, one of these. Oh, because, yeah, I'm going to have to learn that. That's the hardest part. What yeah. I did with the pronunciation is I listened to the audio, and I just wrote it out how I think it should be spelled. Yeah, right? that's a good point. Like how it sounded when I think it's Wolfgang who's reading it out on the audio. Oh, okay. So yeah, I just write it out, and then I, you know, learn a little bit of a part yeah. Yeah, at a time. And being a Freemason also, I have a lot of memory work, so I've been, it's oh, easier for me. So, but, I mean, that's really neither here nor there, but... Okay. Even if you don't have to memorize it, you can read it off your sheet. Okay. Yeah. The idea is, the idea is to do it. The idea is like, th this is the same as sort of praying, but, but, but we have a little more insight into it, what we're doing with it. Like a prayer is the same thing. You're putting your faith in something higher or something maybe hidden. We're doing sort of the same thing, but we're being really specific with it. These, these different entities or beings, which are in reality different principles that come from the higher source. Um, that answer the question. <coughs> so while investigating this line in the higher worlds, Samael and his group entered a luminous temple with elders inside. Um, they were dressed in the robes of masters. They wore sandals and spoke of sublime things. The investigators believed that they were in a temple of white magic before a group of holy masters. The Grand Master began delicately discussing the topic of sex. I mean, we don't go into all of it here, but they started talking and pushing the idea of spilling a cup as being a really positive spiritual thing to do. So once the investigate, one, and then one of the investigators stood up and said, long live the Christ, down with Jave, which is a negative principle. Um, yeah, here. Christ and, and Jave are the two opposite, light and darkness, white and black magic. Like, so we know like the power of the crisis through transmuting the sexual energies and Yahweh or Yahweh would be the exact opposite of that. Um, when they heard this, you know, in this temple, the holy, now we're saying in quotations because we realize they weren't holy entities, the holy face of that venerable elder that spoke suddenly changed color completely, became angry and transformed itself. Those holy elders unmasked themselves they were true princes of darkness, terrible black ma magicians of the world of the cosmic mind. So, okay. So the idea there, too, is we can see this internally, and we can see this externally in the physical, even when we hear people 
talking about things, a lot of, a lot of times we'll see like with the Black Lodge, what we call the Black Lodge, maybe through ignorance or maybe through intention, we'll, we'll mix a lot of truth in and then slowly pepper it with a lot of negative things. Like, uh, I don't want to pick on any one system or anything. There's that one in the, what the bleep that uh, Ram Ramtha, this, this church of Ramtha, which is this woman who apparently uh, channels as being Ramtha, and it has a lot of beautiful messages about love and divinity and that we are spiritual beings and everything. And it says, know that you're perfect. I see you perfect already. You don't have to work on yourselves kind of thing. So there's all these beautiful messages and the idea that you don't have to do any work. We're already holy beings, which in this system would seem as a really negative thing because they're telling people who are essence wrapped in ego that they don't have to do any work. And as we've seen, well, as you all know now, in phase C, that there is a lot of work on this path to incarnate the soul and create the higher bodies and everything. Sometimes it would be a nicer idea that you didn't have to, and if that's the path you choose, that's your choice for sure. But the idea of this path is that it's a lot of work. There is a lot of work you have to do on yourself. So if we were already divine, then there would be no wars, there would be no greed or hate, right? People would be living by these divine principles which we are not seeing in the physical world. So, I mean, maybe I shouldn't call them systems like that by name, because everybody likes different things, but that was just an example. So, the next chunk we're going to do is by Samael Sabaloth and in the name of Elohim Gibor, get the hands and drum a leck. How do you say that? Sabaoth, Sabaoth, yeah, Sabaoth, Elohim Gibor, Elohim Gibor, yeah, Andromelech, Andromelech, yeah, yeah, and like we said, when you go on online, there'll be an audio version of all of this too. So, like I said, the best idea is to write it how you think it should be spelled, the way that Wolfgang's pronouncing it, is the best. I think personally, there's a little bit of give. I don't think it's as like indoctrinated that you have to say the name right or else you're going to invoke the wrong thing because a lot of this is Hebrew and we're not saying the Hebrew, right? Like the word Sabaoth is in Hebrew Sabaoth. We don't have a t sound, a, a T and a Z combination sound. So if you wanted to say it in Hebrew, it would be Sabaoth. But we say it in English, Sabaoth. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the principle that we're invoking so we don't have to get hung up too much on just the names. You don't want to, you know, mix up this one with this one and conjure this guy with that guy, that'd be the exact opposite of what we're trying to do. But if you say Andromalek or Andromalek, person, that's right. Andromalek is the bad guy. Yeah, we're always using the, the good guy. At the beginning. Yeah, at the beginning, to conjure the bad guy. The idea of the conjure, conjuring is that we're casting out the negative. We're using the positive polarity to cast out the negative polarity, whether it be around us or, more importantly, within us internally, before we want to do meditative practices or alchemical practices or just before we want to go to sleep and have some peace of mind. So, Samael is one of the seven primary intelligences of our solar system and his name translates as the bitter beverage of God or the poison of God and can equally be translated as the perfume of God or the medicine of God. So even that name itself has two polarities. Samael is the planetary angel of Mars, and he has been known by many names throughout history, but he is perhaps best known as Ares, Mars, the god of war. As the angel of death, or god of war, traditionally Samael has been viewed as the administer of God's judgment, and because of his controversial role, he has sometimes been labeled a demon or seen as negative. But it's, you know, it's the angel of death, the judgment of God, and he's related to war. And as we know from Samael, Master Samael's teachings, the war is the war on the ego. This is, what, this is the war that he's helping us in now. So Sabaoth, this word Sabaoth, it means hosts, literally, or which is like armies. Armies it refers to the multitude in God's service, the hosts. So you see, in English we see that sometimes. You see Lord of hosts. That would be translated from the Hebrew yod heh val -Hey, Sabaoth, this word. It just means the. Okay, well, there's a nice picture depicting it, yeah. Good job, Ed. So, uh, Elohim Gibor translates to English as a statement that roughly means the male and female divinities are mighty, right? Elohim being the plural of El, God. Gibor, which is from the Gibor, the Sifroth Gibor, which means strength or might. 
So that's why they say male and female divinities, because it's like, or like the gods are strong. El Elohim translates to gods. Gabor is taken from the word Gabura, which means severity, power, or strength. The combination of Samael Sabaoth, the angel of God's judgment, and the armies in God's service with Elohim Gabor, the mighty gods, informs us of how strong this line of the conjuration is, as it is calling upon an immense number of God's forces of spiritual strength. So this is a really important line. We're using a lot of, we're calling in a lot of positive vibes here. Um, this is from the Pista Sophia unveiled by Samael. Bodhisattva. Let it be understood that a Bodhisattva is a seed, a germ, with the possibility of transcendental divine development by means of pressure coming from the height. So it seems, uh, maybe it seems a little bit cryptic. The idea is that we could, we're all Bodhisattvas, basically all fallen right now because we don't have our higher beings incarnated. But the pressure from on height, from the pressure that develops us from the heights is the internal workings of your inner being. They're pushing us, the monad, the intimus, the father who's in secret, your divine mother. If you're on the spiritual path, it's because you're getting a push from these forces. So you don't have to really think of it as you're going it alone. You're doing your part down here because they're doing their part up there and hopefully they're going to connect. That's the, whole, that's the whole plan. Here's a picture. Okay, of Andremelech. I think he spelled it wrong. Andremelech was an idol in the shape of a mule. This is to be concluded from his name, which is compounded of to carry and a king. Still another explanation of the name ascribed to the god the form of a peacock and derives the name from Adair, Magnificent, and Malek, King. So it looks like that's kind of, Ed's doing some big time research back there to tell us what his name means. So we'll have to thank him next time we see him for that one. That's informative. Um, Master Samael and committee invoked in Dremelech in a subterranean cavern in the astral plane. The plane of magic, right? The plane of symbology and the plane of allegory. A gigantic, black, and horrible personage, personage appeared. They made use of the conjuration of Jupiter as before, and the demon submitted to them. That was the Tave Eagles called Slim. That's the conjuration. Now you'll have it, because it'll be in here. So I remember someone was looking for it. I think. I forget who it was. Someone asked me about it before. Okay, so, uh, what yeah. dimension is the astral? The astral is in the fifth dimension. Oh, like the same like the mental? Yeah, the, the mental and the astral are in the same dimension. So They're the two astral. separate planes of one dimension. So the astral is the emotional part? The emotional, exactly. Yeah, the emotional passions, desires. Uh -huh. The mental is the intellectual, obviously. And you can see it in this picture, which will be having dimension one, two, three, dimension four, dimension five with the astral and the mental. Okay. Depicted there. Okay. On another night, Master Samael and his committee again invoked Andremelech. A giant appeared at the door's threshold wearing a black robe and carrying a scepter of, of command in his right hand. The members were shaking and one fled at the sight of Andremelech's eyes. However, Andremelech, full of great decency and delicate manners, stretched out his hand and courteously greeted each of the brothers ancestors, depending on who was there. He sat down and gave them helpful advice. The scepter and chain he wore were from the White Lodge. So in this story, this one's a little, a little confusing, but he, he explains it. Um, after further investigation, the being that they met on the second night was Andromelech, the master of the White Lodge. The master sent his human soul into the world to reincarnate. So the human soul, remember, being at the level of Tifera, above that divine soul, above that intimus. His human soul fell and dedicated itself to black magic. Therefore, that man, the human soul that was sent here, transformed himself into a demon, kind of awoken in darkness, like the idea of the black tantra and the creation of the solar bodies without the elimination of the ego, is to awaken the darkness. <coughs> When the investigator invokes Andremelech and the astral, either Andremelech the demon or Andremelech the grand spiritual master can appear. So I don't know. I've never attempted this kind of thing. But if I did, I'd just start hitting them up with the uh, Tave Eagles Coast Slim and see who we got. That'd be, a good, that'd be one of the good ideas. Right? So this is, this is the idea where we get into some of the more 
maybe complexities of the Gnostic system, the idea of all of our fathers who are in secret are higher spiritual beings in the White Lodge. We're not connected to them. We could awaken in darkness by not eliminating the ego and intentionally practicing black tantra, which is, there is a practice for it. They, they speak about it in the Gnostic Gospels, the Nagamati Library. Not that I'd recommend you know, practicing it, obviously. But uh, we can do that, and then you're going to have what they call a Hannes Musen, Hannes Musen, this thing says, and that's a double polarity entity, entity who has a positive because the father is always positive, and a negative because the person who came here awoken in darkness and now has created a negative side of that entity. And that's what happened with this Andromelec. So it is a little confusing, for sure, but I mean, it's not the most important thing to take away from this lecture, obviously. Um, the next line, we can answer all questions we have, we can talk this thing out if you guys want. But, uh, so by Sakariel and Sashal Malek, be obedient unto Elava Sana Gabriel. That's the next line we're going to talk about. Sakariel is one of the seven primary intelligences of our solar system, and his name translates as the righteousness of God. He is a planetary angel of Jupiter. Sakariel is an angel of mercy, benevolence, and freedom, and the patron angel of all who forgive. So Zachariel, you know, is like that principle of forgiveness and mercy. Sashiel is sometimes considered as another name for Zachariel, and means the covering of God. So it have kind of the connotation of the merciful covering of God kind of thing. However, Zachariel is related to the angelic order of the Hashmalim. We're going to be talking about them in the Invocation of Solomon. Which are found in the fourth Sephiroth, which is Hased. And Sashiel is related to the angelic order of the cherubim, which are found in the ninth Sephiroth uh, of Yasad. So the idea is that it's like the same principle in a varying degrees. That's why it's in two different Sephiroth. So obviously the one in Hesed would be a more, a, a more divine uh, you know, crystallization of this force, and the one in Yasad would be less intense, but still along the same lines, same spiritual principle. Therefore, these two titles or names there you go, he said it right there. Represent the same principle or force, but at varying degrees. And it's both a positive. It's a positive force in varying degrees. Elva and Sana Gabriel, or Sana Gabriel, are both related to the planet Jupiter, but represent its two opposite forces. Elva is the embodiment of the positive ray of Jupiter's influence and an angel of love, altruism, charity, chastity, and sanctity. Sana Gabriel is the embodiment of the negative ray of Jupiter's influence, right? And uh, Jupiter, the, the principle of Jupiter is related to the law, like the, the divine law. So, whereas, you know, we have, uh, which guys, Elva is like the positive idea of the law, or following the obeying of the law. Sana Gabriel would be the opposite of that, you know, not, not obeying the law. The, Ju the Jupiterian vibration is the force which grants power to the kings and hierarchs of diverse religions. The planet Jupiter is extraordinary, mystical, regal, and sublime. This is the positive ray of Jupiter. On the other hand, its opposite is the force of the materialistic atheist, enemies of the eternal. The blasphemers, those who hate divinity, and the heretics, those who cultivate the dogma of separatism. So we can see how those two principles would exist within ourselves internally. And the idea of invoking the positive one to conjure up the negative one is the idea of us invoking within ourselves the power of, you know, re re not even so much like religious as dogmatic, but, s but spiritual reverence and b by casting out our own type of heretical ideas of we should all be separated and everybody's different, right? Which doesn't really... Which that, that kind of thing doesn't sit well with any monotheistic faith in my mind. If you have a monotheistic faith, like the Abrahamic faith, then there's one God, then there's one God. You, know, you can't say there's one God, you know, but the, the Jews have a different one. But we have the right one, and these guys have a different one. There's one God. Yes? Do you know what picture that is? Um, no, like I said, it's this uh, is my brother's. You saw Dor, and it's okay. the fall of Lucifer. The fall of Lucifer. Okay. You saw Dor, so that'd be from, from Paradise, Paradise Lost, is the pictures of so. Yeah. yeah, that's the one. Yeah, okay, cool. Very cool. So the fall of Lucifer, the bringer of light. Oh, yeah, right? Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost, yeah. The same group of paintings. Right, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I know Ed used a lot of those paintings. 
some massive, I think, were they engravings or paintings? I, can't remember. I think they were engravings. I think they were too. Yeah. So Master Samael and committee invoked Santa Gabriel and the internal worlds. They heard the footsteps of claws or nails coming towards them and then saw a terrible being. They saw his tremendously horrible face. That diabolical beast's terrible aspect surprised them so much that they returned to their physical bodies instantaneously. <laughs> so they kind of wigged out on this one. Yeah, exactly. They kind of, oh man, we have to regroup on this one, guys. <laughs> so the next time, they, 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 they cowboyed up and then the next time they invoked Santa Gabriel, he appeared in human form as a banker and wanted to talk to them about money. He offered them prize-winning lottery numbers, according to him, so that they could buy the winning ticket. With these temptations, he tried to attract them to his sphere of tenebrous influence, that sphere of materialism being attached to the material. The idea we've talked before that money is neutral, it's neither good nor bad, but here he's trying to influence them in negative. Take the money, you know, just live easy, don't worry about all this kind of invoking me and this weird stuff, just go buy a yacht, it'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can see that within ourselves well, also. Yes. Well, what would, what would the, the harm be in taking those numbers? I mean, it's what you do with the money. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, the, the, the idea in this one is that... Yeah. Oh you failed. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we ha I we have, a, it, okay. we have a bigger center, for sure. Right? <laughs> I would take it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the idea with this one in this book, he, he's just really... Uh, what Ed's done here is he's really gotten down to point form. There's a lot more information, but the idea was that they would... Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I was always saying with those lottery winners, um, mm -hmm. sometimes you think, oh, well, they didn't, you know, um, build a school or dig a well or something. They bought themselves a yacht. But yeah. that created jobs, thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to buy those yachts. True. And somebody made the Mercedes and somebody, you know, That's built their home. Yeah. So yeah. they've yeah. actually given back mm -hmm. almost in this, mm -hmm. you know. Because yeah, even though you're it. trying to be <laughs> Oh no, like, no, no, I'm with you. The it's just the way it's the way our society is made up. You can I argue that the way our society is made up is corrupt and the distribution of wealth and all that thing. That kind of stuff. But to to go back and answer that is that in this story they they were offered these numbers in this lottery in lieu of spiritual training or spiritual uh, lessons. Oh, you can you can receive oh, you can take your payment, maybe if you have Dharma positive you can take it physically, or you can take it spiritually. Like maybe uh, you're really good in one life, so the next life so you get to be king. It, it, it's kind of a trade off. You don't mm -hmm. give you these numbers but to stop yeah. studying this Exactly. He was doing it yeah as a way to, to veer him off the path of spirituality towards the path of material. Uh, yeah. Yes. Why would he want to make them like go off the path. Yeah. He would he would want to because like an external entity, which is also an internal entity we have, this is the part of ourselves that oh, okay. you know, wants to pull right. down. We have like two beings within us, the ego That's and right. the material You're and right. the spiritual. So yeah. we can see yeah. that within us. Yeah. Like, you know what? I would love to do all this work, but uh maybe I should just stick to working at the garage and live my life already. Right. You know, it's easier that way. That could be an idea of this influence of this demon, right? I'm sure that comes the, demo, the demons are more closely related to egos, and the egos are eternal, but they're also universal. We will all have the same types of egos, right? We all have the egos of lust, the seven basic, you know, greed, gluttony, all these things, we have them within us. That's why it can be generalized for all of us, too. They, they maybe they manifest themselves in different ways through each individual, but the same ones exist in all of us, because they're these universal principles. The lower degree of this universal principle that comes from the higher spiritual realms. Yeah. Well, I think we're getting through it, so... Here's a big chunk. By the divine and human name of Shaddai, and by the sign of the pentagram which I hold in my right hand, in the name of the angel Anael, and by the power of Adam and Eve, who are Yod Hava, Begon Lilith, let us rest in peace, Nahama. Begon Lilith, so Lilith is a bad one too. Lilith is a negative entity, yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's been it's been sort of switched around in our society now with like attached to the feminist movement a little bit like in, with the little affairs and all of that kind of thing. But how do you say the last one? Uh, uh, Nahama, Nahama, yeah, Nahama. They're sort of they're sort of really similar. We'll get into it. And it's Yodhava. Yodhava. Yod Yodhava or Yodhava or Yodhava, but probably Yodhava will do. Yeah. So, Shaddai is one of the Hebrew names of God and translates as Almighty, like El Shaddai, or God on High, or God Almighty. It is possible, however, that the original significance was that of overmastering 
or overpowering strength. So the idea of the overpowering strength of God, who is from on high, the Almighty. The symbolism of the pentagram is represented by the hand because the five fingers are emblematic of the five points of the pentagram. And the idea of it being in the right hand is the idea of it being used positively as opposed to, say, the left hand would be the inverted pentagram. What happened there? Oh, I see what's going on here. He's just giving it to us all at once. That's cool. So, Anael is one of the seven primary intelligences of our solar system, and his name translates as the joy of God, the grace of God, and he is associated with the planet Venus. Anael is considered the angel of love and has dominion over the air. Adam and Eve, when represented as yod is a symbol of the perfected being, man as the image of God, the masculine and feminine force in equilibrium and harmony. That's why I saw that the yod is basically like, sort of a, represents the Elohim, the plural male-female androgynous being. The use of Anael alongside Adam yod tells us that the negative force in this line is being conjured by the forces that represent love and sexuality in their purest forms. Because, as we said, Anael being the angel of love, Yot Hava being the combined male and female principles as the sexual purity, basically. So, Lilith and Nahama are two terrible and perverse demons. These two demons govern the spheres of the abyss. Lilith translates as female night spirit demon. Lilith is also called the mother of abortions. She is the mother of demons, and her offspring have had many names, but are commonly known as the succubus and the incubus, which prey on sleeping men and women in order to fornicate with them and cause them to fall. The idea of nocturnal emissions. This is why, maybe for, for men more particularly, or we'll say adolescent boys, it's always, it's always brought on by a dream or something you can always see, but sometimes we'll think the latter is affecting the former, but in reality it's this dream or this thought that's causing this thing, and this thought is, is this idea of this entity of Lilith that's causing them to fall. Lilith is considered the demon of fornicators, sexual per perversity, and crimes against nature. Lilith represents the negative ray of Venus, right? Where Anael was the positive ray. The origin of fornication is in Lilith. The or origin of separate individual individuality is in Lilith. And the origin of the eye is in the black moon of Lilith. So, yes. Is the word abortion applied to um, how you're not actually giving birth to something, you're just doing it? That's how I, that's how I would uh, interpret it. Okay. Not, not of like the physical no, no. practice of abortion, but the fact that you're wasting the seeds of life or the powers of life for the female and not using it for procreation of life but for the the fulfilling of your own internal desires. So it's, it's, a, it's more of a selfish thing. Whereas the transmutation is an unselfish thing because it's for the Father, right, the Divine Mother. So Lilith has more of a positive connotation in our society today just because of these little affairs. But they, they took this old Hebraic Mishnah story about Lilith being the first wife of Adam, that she was banned, and that that's not cool, you know, she's a feminist and we should follow her, yeah. But women aren't really spilling any seeds or anything, no, so it's but not it, the same as men. It's so not, well, not the same exactly in that way, but it's the energies, too, that creative energy. energy. Yeah. yeah, the okay. idea of this losing of the creative energy and what it does to the body and everything. But yeah, so when they have these little affairs and stuff, you got to be like, I don't know. They're latching onto one aspect of, of that story and not the other aspect that she was the first wife, not fit for Adam because she was the wife of fornication and she was this temptress demon, always portrayed as evil, but then when they had a little affair, like, no, it's not cool. You gotta, gotta see she's alright. But, I mean, you can't really pick and choose, I guess, what I'm trying to say the story. The whole story is, obviously, she's showing in a negative light. So, Nahama is a symbol in Kabbalah related to lust, seduction, and the infernal worlds. Nahama is the faithful and mortal beauty. When a man is unfaithful to his wife and dedicates himself to lustful passions, God takes away his wife to throw him into the arms of Nahama. This is kind of like a poetic interpretation of these principles. This queen of the infernals knows how to seduce him with all the enchantments of virginity and love. She leads astray the hearts of fathers, pushing them to abandon their children. She makes married people dream of other lovers, and the men consecrated to God to dream of marriage. This is... He took this from a demonology book, I believe. 
and Nahama's fatal beauty and Lilith's sexual crimes are the antithesis of the perfect marriage, the exact opposite. So whereas Lilith is the actual, we'll say fornication, act of fornication, Nahama is a, is a little more subtle, so that much, you know, more evil, because she portrays, or like this feeling is the idea of chastity and virginity and beauty and everything, but at the end still coming to the same ends as with Lilith. More deceitful. more deceitful, exactly. And it makes you think you're doing something good. And it's not so much that we can view it as a she and she's leading men astray, but it's that principle within us that will lead us astray. Say if you're married and you're like, you know, I bet this other girl, she's really beautiful and she'll probably be, you know, really nice and we'll have a happy life and everything. Then you leave your wife and you turn out falling into the spilling of the seeds and all kinds of stuff and it's not how you imagined it because it never is, right? This is the this is this principle in, in in action. But that also goes for women. Goes for women, exactly. That's what I'm saying. We shouldn't view it as just like a she leading men astray because it's no, the principle it's within us. Principle, it's the principle yeah, within a woman right. says, you know, it has my no sex. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's oh, gender, I yeah. Say. My husband's always leaving the toilet seat up. I'm gonna leave him for another guy. He's always gonna put the toilet seat down. It's gonna be beautiful. Oh, and then the leader, so guess what? Boring. Seats up. <laughs> yeah. No good. So <laughs> My husband's so boring. He just he's a yeah. couch potato. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'll go out to the bar and see what I can pick that's up. Good. He doesn't understand me. <laughs> Guess what? No one understands you because no one understands themselves. So, there we go. So Master Samael and committee invoked the demon of Lilith, the demon Lilith, and the angel Anael simultaneously. The angel Anael came at our call in the form of a beautiful boy who had a luminous appearance. A few minutes later, another boy of the exact size of Anael entered the room. This boy had a malignant and perverse appearance. These two opposites of Venus sat face to face, Anael and Lilith, love and counter love. Lilith did not dare look at Anael's severe, radiant, and luminous face. So we can kind of grasp from this, like, this, this is classic allegory. When we understand the principles that are happening here, we can understand what's going on here. So, like we said, Anael is the positive force. Lilith is the opposite force. That's why they're twins, because they're the same. Of, they're the same. They're, they're opposite polarities of the same exact force. This love, counter love, singularity, and there are varying degrees of it, varying poles to be exact. And uh, one could not look at the other. I think obviously because that relates to us how one is below the other one or ashamed because it knows that the higher one is the one that we should be following. So we can internalize it as that also. But doesn't it also mean that darkness can't stand the, the, the bright, the brightness because if they have turned away from the light? Sure. So they can't stand to see the, the light? Absolutely. And then the idea of darkness and light also relates to truth. Mm -hmm. Truth is always related to light, so it could be the idea that they can't take the, the light they, they're far from the truth. They're in darkness, they're blind, they don't see the reality of the light. Yeah. So, I mean, we can take it that way. In the astral plane, it would appear just like this. You would see it, yeah. So, could Anna be the same as Uriel? Um, Uriel, Uriel, I think, is, is closely related, and I think Uriel. he talks about it next. <coughs> but uh, I'm not really sure. Like I said, I didn't do the research on this left. But I did, I did obviously take it in the face scene and everything. But <coughs> Uriel is coming up, I think. By the Holy Elohim, and by the names of the genie Kashiel, Sahaltiel, Aphael, and Zorahiel, at the command of Ariphiel, uh, begone Malak, we deny thee our children to devour. Uriel, Aniel, and Uriel. I think Aniel and Uriel are the same, but it's just two different pronunciations of, or two different translations, because a lot of the translations, I'm not 100% sure, I can get back to you on that. Yeah, I didn't even thought about it. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times when an angel has one name in one language, it has a different name in a different language, but it's the same exact principle, right? Could be the same thing like that. So Anael and Uriel could be the same? Could be the same. I'm not sure if he... Could be the same because Uriel is the ruler of, of, of Jupiter, of, of Venus, right? Mm -hmm. And it could just be our interpretation of what they're called. Mm -hmm. So just like, you know, like a, like we said, like an apple and a tear, like a potato and a pomme de terre, the same thing too. For languages. One's not right or wrong. Yes. Now, uh, all the angels are represented as astral bodies, physical, like planetary bodies. Do they coincide with astrological symbols? Um, I, bl I believe they like do. When we talk about twins and things like that, it just yeah. sounds like. They sound like Gemini and stuff like that. And the fish. And and the fish, yeah. Pisces, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 no, no. It, it definitely could because they are related. 
like in the Kabbalistic study, when we saw the three were the three primary forces, then the seven doubles represent these seven planets, and twelve elementals were the twelve signs of the zodiac. And then houses of planets can affect the, all the stars yeah. can affect the planets themselves. And I've read in old cap most of the stuff I'm coming out is from the old Kabbalistic <coughs> research stuff, not necessarily from the, from what I've read in Gnosticism. But the idea is that this principle will come through from its source and come through a planet at, and act at, uh, like a less a lower vibration, then come through a astrological sign on a lower vibration, and finally manifest itself through humanity. There are, I don't know, I'm not sure if he talks about it in this lecture or not, but he may. So okay. maybe we'll go on and go up. So read this one, yeah. By the Holy Elohim, by the names of the Genie Cassio, Salty, Raphael, and Zorahel, at the command of Raphael, begone, Moloch, we deny thee our children to devour. This is the last line, I think, too, the last section. So, Raphael is one of the primary intelligences of our solar system and translates as the face of God. Raphael is the planetary angel of Saturn and is associated with steadfastness, consistency, firm loyalty, and integrity. Saturn is also related, remember, with death. Saturn is the, the law of death, that kind of thing. So it can be used for the death of the ego or the death of the physical body. Uh, in this line of the conjuration, we see the names of six positive deities being invoked to conjure the name of one negative entity. So right off the bat, we know this is a big one. So we've got all these positive forces for one negative force. Kashiel is the angel of temperance associated with Saturn, the angel, the angel of death for kings and other important people. So it's related to Saturn that way. Sahaltiel literally translates as the prayer of God. Aphiel is appointed over the spirits of the wicked in order to cast them down to be punished in the fire. So this is still related with the death. Zahariel is translated as God's command and is one of the primary angels who leads souls to judgment. Okay. So all these, all these angels have different jobs but within the sphere of Jupiter, within the idea of death. The sphere of death. So they're all related that way. To uh, to Jupiter, yeah. To Jupiter. Jupiter or Saturn? Mm, Saturn, sorry. Sorry, Saturn. I meant Saturn. I was saying that. Sorry about Jupiter. I had Jupiter on the brain. Jupiter was the law. Saturn. Saturn is death. That's why Saturn is usually depicted with a, as an angel with a sickle. Sometimes you'll see, like if you see Masonic art, sometimes they'll have the angel with a sickle braiding the woman's hair at a broken column. So it's the idea that your time is limited before you're going to die. Everyone's going to die, so you have to do the work while the light... You have to make hay while the sun shines is the idea. Make hay while the sun shines, so you have a small amount of time to do the work. So, Moloch is one of two chief demons of revolt and anarchy, the other one being Satan. Satan comes from the Hebrew Hasatan, which means literally the adversary. So, ancient tradition says Moloch was an iron bull that was heated red hot and children were thrown to its belly. Moloch is associated with the horrible practice of human sacrifice and Moloch is a strong representation of false idol worship. Internally, we could take it internally also and um, the idea of the sacrificing of the baby. Um, internally, what would the yeah, ideas would that represent within us? What baby would we be sacrificing to this horrible being? It could be... Uh, yeah, the soul or the higher being. And he's sacrificing this higher being for this, you know, iron bull, which is this really material kind of uh, false idol worship. So the idea of losing our souls by coming off the path to follow anything else. Our <coughs> virtues. Our virtues. Yeah, our virtues, yeah. And All maybe this kind of that's related to the children, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of times, even in the Gnostic Gospels, and we're translating the Christian Gospels from the Gnostic Gospels, the idea of children didn't, didn't always mean literal children. It meant people who were new on the path, or not very far along the path. So where it's explained more in the Gnostic Gospels, obviously, than in the institutionalized dogmatic Christian Gospels. But they'll talk about, you know, where Jesus says it's better to throw a rock stone around your neck and throw yourself in the ocean than to cause one of my children to fall off the path and everything. I'm talking about leading people on the spiritual path astray. The children being, like, say us, we'd be the children because we're so young in our... Not that I'm trying to label you guys, but generally we're so, we're, we're so young. We're so young, we're so, you know, we're not very far along generally on the path. And that's what the children can represent most of the time. Most of the time. 
The Gnostic Gospels are really interesting if, if you read them. Now, a lot of Samael's stuff was done without that because that's more recent, right? 1945. He was around in 45. But, I've read them. But yeah, the Nag Hammadi Library and the yes. Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a lot of stuff in there. They even talk about this practice of black magic in there, and they talk about the can't be forgiven. And they talk about the idea also that there's a secret that can't get out, and that's hell is not eternal. Same idea that we have. It's a system of purification that can lead to the divine, but without the merit of free will, is how they explain in the Gnostic Gnostics. Everything that we teach here is based on these ancient Gnostic principles. You can see that Samuel had a really good grasp of them. If nothing else, what I tell most people, if they're not into Samuel, which is fine, you know, everyone's into their own thing, but like, if nothing else, at, at the lowest possible degree of, of your acceptance of him, he, is he had a massive, massive amount of knowledge of the esoteric systems of so many different schools, whether it be Buddhism, Kabbalah, Gnosticism, Christianity. So, I mean, some people won't, won't take the whole idea of being of incarnated masters, you know, some people aren't really into that, but if nothing else, it's undeniable that he was at least this. In my mind. In my mind. In my mind he was what he says he was. Because I've practiced and they told me to practice something, I practice it. They say this will be the result and I've seen that result. For me the proof has mostly been always in the pudding. So it's good to come here and learn it, you know, learn it uh, intellectually because that's where we start to learn. Right? That's how we start to learn all this stuff. But the idea is put it in practice. Like I said, when I had that experience with doing the conjurations and it made, you know, the nightmares or the bad dreams or the whatever succubuses and all this stuff stop, I said, there's something to this. I don't know exactly how or why it works yet. Master Samael says it's because of this. But for me, I felt it. And you only have to prove it to yourself, basically. We're not trying to push any ideas on you. We're trying to show you a system. This is a system, right? This is a system. You can apply it or not apply it. It's up to you. But the idea is... You'll, you'll gain faith through its application. You don't have to take it at, at my word, obviously, because I'm not an enlightened master or anything. Yes? So if you're going to do conjurations, mm -hmm. what that you would say the conjuration of the fourth verse and the conjuration of the seventh, mm -hmm. then you would be back to the Gnostic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, you would do the Shia and then the. Uh, yeah. Black, black, black. yeah, there's another part that, that follows this also. Yeah. There's a the whole yeah, conjuration of the four, seven. You do the, uh, the you do the protective circle. You do oh, the invocation. Oh yes, of Solomon. Oh, so you just yeah. still do that circle, yeah. like, like, yeah. like we would do after Bay Bay Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you would do it after that. Yeah, all, all, yeah. All this stuff is like bailing yeah. to a higher degree, yes. a more okay. yeah. higher degree. Yeah. It's the exact same principles they taught with bailing. This is why we're doing this thing. Same thing. I think that. Oh, there's more. Sorry. So. Yeah, yeah. Master Samael and committee outside the physical body invoke Moloch and sink into the atomic infernals of nature. They see the multitude who inhabit the abyss. They saw an Arab rider wearing a blood-colored robe and oriental turban charge towards them, opening a way among the multitudes. This terrible demon Moloch appears mocking to them and then leaves. Oh, the end. So that's what they saw in the astral. That's how it was appeared in the astral, like you said, which is, uh, you know... The, oh, the so that magic. was the Arab writer was what, a representation of Moloch? Of Moloch, yeah. I don't know if it has anything. Just like how the Greek the Greek god had has less to do with that than the principle that I mentioned. So that is the lecture. Wow. Wow. Well, 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 I missed a whole bunch, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but it'll be online. Was, uh, was that all seven, or is the seven the Satan? Um, that was all seven. Okay. Yeah. So, um, with uh, Moloch, uh, I've, I've heard somewhere, or I think I read it somewhere, uh, that he was some sort of uh, representation of actually the physical uh, laws of nature in itself. Like, this physical world sure. is some sort of manifestation of Moloch or Satan or something like that. Is, is that any bit true? Yeah, I could apply it to that too. The idea of, like, sacrificing the baby to being 100% uh, connected to the material world. That's totally like eliminating the spiritual if, you're, if you fall in love with the material world. I mean, we should be thankful mm -hmm. for the material world, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And our material bodies, this is the temple we can use, but you can't be too attached to it that you don't want to pursue the, the practical, I mean the spiritual, because this will dust to dust, right? From the spirit to the spirit, so. Sure, I mean, you can get, you can get way deeper with it if you 
what I find never take anything literally. Yeah. Right? Right? If you take stuff literally, then that's when you start, I think, to get locked into divisions amongst religions and people and, and divisions amongst systems. When you look at it allegorically, then you can do comparative religions on a, on a scale that says, you know, they're more in common than they do it, than they do it hard. In my own mind, that's why I see So we'll take a short break. And then we'll do a meditation. You forgot to include your Amen. Oh yeah. Amen. 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 We'll talk about that one in the invocation of Solomon too.